There we go. So I'll start over again. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming out. Uh, this is Jumping Off the Deep End with Node.js. Uh, my name is Kevin Griffin. And if you never have uh, seen me present before um, around the country, I'm an independent consultant or trainer uh, based out of the Norfolk, Virginia area. Um, if any time after this session, you would like to get in contact with me, maybe ask me any follow-up questions, uh, please feel free to. Um, my email address is kevin at kevgriffin.com uh, or Twitter. Twitter is a probably the fastest means of asking me any uh, questions. Um, I'm on Twitter at one kevgriff. Uh, so today, um, oh, before we get started, a couple things that I just need to talk about. Uh, I have a book I have available up for pre-order called the Twilio Blueprint. Um, if anyone out there is interested in building uh, SMS or voice-capable applications, uh, so sending text messages or making and receiving phone calls, setting up voice uh, conferences, stuff like that, um, I definitely recommend you take a look at my book, the Twilio Blueprint. Uh, the best part about it is all the examples are written in Node.js. So if you decide to move on with Node after this session, uh, the Twilio Blueprint will uh, have all the examples written in something that you can understand. And since it's a pre-order special, you get this book for way over 50% off. Um, for $17 instead of $39 that the price will go up to when the book is released later in the month. Uh, and if after this session you really want to dive in and learn more about Node.js uh, and what it means to build an end-to-end -end web application, uh, in January I'm teaching a three-day course for Wintelect uh, on mastering Node.js and mean in -to end web development. Um, and as a participant in this webinar, you're eligible for a 10% um, 10 percent off registration uh, discount. Uh, there's no offer codes or anything available. All you have to do is contact Miss uh, Kimberly Pruitt at Wintelect. Um, I have her email address up here on the screen, but she would be more than happy to get you set up if you're interested in in this course. Uh, it's a purely virtual course, so you don't have to even get dressed to, to participate. And I'll put this slide up at the end so so we can talk uh, talk more about it. Uh, so let's talk about Node.js. Um, the purpose of this talk is to give you a very 100 level overview explanation of what Node.js is um, and just kind of how the ecosystem works and where we all kind of fit into it. Um, I really like this talk to be QA heavy. Uh, so if you have no questions, uh, we'll be done in 20 minutes. But I'm hoping you have questions. So I've turned on questions within the webinar. So please just use your Q&A tab and uh, start piling questions in as you think of them. Uh, you can always go back, update your questions later. Uh, but I will go to the Q&A tab here in a couple minutes. And we'll start walking through what your questions are. Uh, so Node.js. Uh, so real quick, my background in Node.js. I've been working with Node for years and years and years. Um, and if we look at Node in terms of versions, I've been working with Node.js since the, the 0.6 um, era. Uh, currently, Node.js is at version 5, which that is a whole another discussion. But um, if we look at just timelines, I've been working with Node.js for, for a couple years now. Uh, I have spent most of my career as a .NET guy, uh, working with C Sharp. Um, I've done quite a bit with C++ um, in different organizations. I have built a, a startup, um, no longer exists, but our whole infrastructure is built on Node.js. And that's after a full conversion from C Sharp um, .NET over to Node.js. And I've also worked with several customers to get their they're full stacks um, running on Node.js. So I like to think I, I've worked in it long enough where I can talk intelligently about pretty much any topic um, with here within. 
Uh, if you've never really looked at Node.js, uh, let's let's uh, have a quick history lesson. Um, Node.js has only been around for a handful of years. Uh, initially developed in 2009 by a gentleman named Ryan Dahl. And Ryan looked at uh, the Google V8 engine and said, well, this works really well in the browser. And I really like JavaScript, but I really would like to use JavaScript on just a server. It would work well for different scripting tasks that I have um, and for building out uh, some web servers. Uh, and so he said, well, why can't I just take V8 and port it to, to work on a server? Uh, and this isn't a new idea. If we look at the history of JavaScript over the past 25 years, uh, people have attempted this before. JavaScript on the server isn't a new concept. Now the problem is if we look at all the previous attempts of porting JavaScript to a uh, server implementation, it's falls into the kind of the same realm that we had with browsers um, a, a while back. If you remember in the good old days when we had IE, um, we didn't really have Chrome, we had Firefox or Mozilla, Netscape, and they all had their own brand of JavaScript. And is where libraries like jQuery really started coming up because you couldn't write the same amount of JavaScript that worked the same way on every browser. And when folks were writing server-based JavaScript engines, they were running into the same problems. JavaScript that would run in the browser couldn't run on their servers. You would have to le learn a different dialect of JavaScript. So those never really took off. In 2009, because Ryan Dahl took uh, Google V8, which was already a tried and true battle-tested um, JavaScript engine, he could take that engine and just add hooks into it to to access uh, parts of the operating system. So like the network stack, uh, file IO stack, um, and different things that we'll talk about here in a couple minutes. And because it was built on the Google V8 engine, he could take advantage of their upgrades as they were implemented. So every time Google V8 got an update, he could pull that into Node.js. And over the years, actually one of the things that happened is Node.js deviated uh, quite a bit from Google V8 uh, to the point where they couldn't take in Google V8 changes anymore. Um, one of the things I don't have on here is you might have heard about a whole uh, uh, community forking um, called IOJS, which IOJS is essentially Node.js, except its whole goal was to bring Node.js back to the original Google V8 fork. Um, and your benefit, if you're getting into Node.js now, that's all that's all been said and done. IOJS has uh, come back into Node.js, and that's how we go for, went from a .12 version of Node.js to now a v4 or v5 version of uh, Node.js. And it's all because of um, the community coming in and pulling Google V8 updates in as, as needed. Uh, but the whole purpose of Node.js is to build highly scalable network-based applications. Um, and it does this really well. Not only that, it's completely cross-platform. So if you're developing on a Windows machine, but you need to deploy to a Linux machine, that's all perfectly fine. Um, when we were building our startup, WinSitter, um, which was all Node.js uh, a long time ago, um, my I worked primarily on Windows. My colleague worked primarily on his Mac, and we were both deploying to a Linux machine. So uh, as long as we agreed on particular versions of Node.js, everything worked uh, without a huge amount of issue. Uh, a common question that comes up is who who's using Node.js? Is this really battle, battle tested? Uh, well, there's a couple small companies that um, use Node.js that you probably have heard of. 
Um, IBM, Microsoft, Yahoo, Walmart, Groupon, LinkedIn, PayPal, uh, they have they all have significant parts of their infrastructure that are running on top of Node.js. Uh, in particular, I, I like to talk about Walmart and PayPal uh, and also LinkedIn. Uh, if you go to their engineering blogs, which uh, I don't have the links in here, I'm sorry, they talk in depth about how they have used Node.js to build out the more scalable parts of their infrastructures. Look at Walmart, for example. Uh, Walmart uh, usually gets a, a pretty regular amount of traffic uh, during the course of the year, but on days like Black Friday or Cyber Monday, that traffic can spike exponentially uh, just because there are more people hitting their sites. Um, they have done case studies on how their Node.js-based infrastructure allowed them to scale without any significant issues. Uh, and it was fun. I didn't see him do it this year, but the uh, one of the lead devs for Walmart last year uh, was live tweeting their network stats uh, over the course of the day um, on Black Friday. At, and they were able to see where Node.js was helping them and places that they could prove upon. Um, but it was a it was really interesting case study. Uh, additionally, on here, uh, we have PayPal. Um, PayPal, if you go read their engineering blog, uh, they have a case study of a couple years back, they were looking to uh, rewrite their entire uh, backend infrastructure. And they were looking at Node.js using um, uh, Node.js using JavaScript, and they were also looking at Java because they had been primarily a Java backend. Um, so they had thought, well, let's take our primary team and we're going to start rebuilding in Java. Um, but just for fun, let's let a couple other people um, try to implement these same services in Node.js. And what ended up having, happening is over the course of a couple months, um, the Node.js people had completely finished uh, the spec that they had um, set out to, um, to write. And the Java folks were st still chugging along, and they had a full team, whereas the Node.js team was uh, maybe three or four people. Uh, and it was with that decision of how quickly they were able to develop and iterate, PayPal decided to build most of their infrastructure on top of Node.js. So if you go to PayPal for any reason, uh, all those services you're hitting are most likely Node.js. Uh, and the last one I probably would talk about on here is LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn rebuilt their mobile platform, um, mobile web services platform, all on Node.js. Uh, another interesting case, if you're uh, looking for any particular examples or really fodder to, to push your organization towards using Node.js. So the next common question that comes up uh, is, Kevin, um, Node.js, it's really fast, right? And the answer is yes, but if you're looking for just raw speed, um, it's probably not the best choice out there. Uh, Node.js isn't really known for its speed. It's known for its scalability. Um, so if we go look at the good folks over at um, Tech & Power, uh, they do a regular series of benchmarking um, for a variety of configurations. So if we... Uh, looked at their latest set of benchmarks, which I think they just ran a, a, a week or two ago. Um, they look at uh, common setups, so, and then report on how, how quickly uh, these servers were able to respond. Uh, so if we look at the charts here, how do you read this? Well, it's uh, a particular framework stack, uh, and they have a couple different flavors that they support. You have um, either just a platform that returns uh, particular responses. Uh, you could have a full stack that talks to a database and has to do some sort of logic. Um, they have a couple different configurations. And if you want to enter a stack into their benchmarks, you basically just have to design a sample application that uses the technology you're, you're looking to have benchmarked and it has to solve um, 
the particular problems that uh, Tech and Power is looking for. Uh, and there's a huge list of different frameworks and configurations um, available. So if we look at the top of the stack, um, the fastest framework that you could use right now is ULib, uh, talking to Postgres. Uh, and that's getting 320,000 uh, requests per second, which is really good. Um, and over on the right-hand side, it's really hard to tell, but it's telling you it's looking at a particular platform. The, the library is written in C++. Uh, it's hosted on a Linux server. Uh, there's... And I don't remember what the don't even remember what the rest of these uh, acronyms are for. Um, but if we go down the list, uh, you'll see a variety of Java-based uh, platforms, um, a couple of Go-based platforms, C++. And if we just keep going down, uh, eventually we get to a Node.js implementation. So Node.js talking to MongoDB. Uh, this is the first JavaScript-based, Node.js-based um, platform that gets benchmarked. And that's returning uh, 54,000 requests per second, which isn't bad. That's that's pretty darn good. Um, because if we keep going down the list, uh, there's many, many different uh, platforms that are much, much slower. Uh, so going with Node.js as a single instance, it, it's going to be decently fast, but if you're going for just raw speed um, for doing di different things, it's probably not going to be your first choice. Uh, if you want to go look at these benchmarks yourself, I have the link here, um, techempower.com slash benchmarks. Uh, they're pretty reliant um, uh, in the industry, so go take a look. Um, for any of these different configurations, you can take a look and see uh, what tests, um, how their tests were set up, and if you want to try to replicate the test yourself. All right, so a couple of the, the pros of using Node.js. Um, the first one is there's just one language to rule them all, uh, and that's JavaScript. Uh, you might have heard the term full stack developer, where a developer can work on not just the server server side but also on the client side the the big pro of JavaScript is if I know how to write JavaScript in the browser it's not a huge leap for me to write JavaScript on the server <clears throat> excuse me uh, next there's a, a very robust package library um, NPM which is the, the node package manager. And over the past several years, um, the node package manager has been a great source of just of libraries that don't make us have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, we'll talk about co a couple of the common libraries here in a moment. Um, and we'll actually walk through an example of uh, pulling in a package, uh, bringing it into code, and just building a simple web server. Uh, the community is amazing. Um, there was a great chart that I couldn't find where it showed the community engagement of different communities like um, the .NET C Sharp community, the Java community, uh, the Ruby community. And you it showed just a gradual uptake of all these different communities over years. And with Node.js, it started out... Uh, very small, uh, just gradually growing, and all of a sudden sp just spiked uh, and overtook all these other development communities within within months. And it shows. If you go out and look for any JavaScript material, there's a plethora of it out there. And there's a huge community actively engaged in pushing this technology further and further and further. So it's not like... A, you're going to get in and all of a sudden not have any support out there. If you get in and run into any issues, there's most likely going to be uh, dozens and dozens of people willing and able to help you. And as we just talked about, it's pretty fast. Um, there's ways to make it faster, and we can talk about that a little bit later. A couple of the cons. So you can't 
have the good without the bad. So uh, one of the big problems with Node.js is that it's single-threaded. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, I'm getting over bronchitis, so <laughs> I have to stop every now and then to the, the cough. Um, so there's one thread to rule them all. Um, the the problem with this, so the nice thing about this is it allows us to write um, asynchronous code. Uh, because JavaScript's all async, I can write code that will go do something like talk to the file system, talk to a web service, um, et cetera, talk to a database. And those calls can happen asynchronously of any other work that I'm trying to do. Um, this is what makes Node.js really work really well for network applications because I can support uh, a request coming in while I'm talking to a database for another request and I can kind of juggle um, with a, a couple dozen hands. The way this starts to fall off is that there's an actual limit of how much we can do on a single thread. Uh, there are ways to get around this though. Um, because Node is designed to be scalable, we can scale either vertically or horizontally. Um, horizontal scaling says we can just run multiple threads on a single machine. So if I throw a Node.js application on um, my awesome 16 core, uh, 32 gigs of RAM server, uh, if I'm only using one thread, it's, it's really not taking advantage. Uh, but I can write some code uh, with Node to tell it, well, execute one Node.js process per core that I have available. So if I have 16 cores, I can take advantage of 16 cores by running 16 Node.js processes. Um, uh, we talked a little bit about speed. If you're looking for just raw speed, um, Node.js isn't really your, going to be your first choice. Um, it also doesn't have its own service stack. Uh, so what we'll see here in a minute is I'll build a web server with Node.js, but I run a command from the command line. So Node.js or Node and then the name of my file. If I'm running this uh, in a production or development environment, I want something that will make sure the service is always running, um, make sure it can run in the background, and take care of things like, hey, there's a crash, restart the service. Uh, the community has really stepped in, and there's different packages that will do this for you. Um, for example, is PM2, and there's another package called Forever. Uh, if you're deploying to Ubuntu-based servers, you can also take advantage of a Ubuntu um, service called Upstart which uh, we used with our startup and we actually felt was less friction than using PM2 or forever. Um, so that means you'll have to write a little bit of infrastructure uh, to, to support this. It's not like I can just easily um, deploy to IS or deploy to Apache and everything just magically works. You have to do a little bit of gluing in between. Uh, a couple of the packages. Um, in, if you go to npmjs.org uh, or .com, um, there's a list of the most popular packages out there. Uh, if we're talking web-based applications, Express is bar none the, the number one um, package out there. I'm not saying it's the best. I'm not saying it's the fastest. I'm saying it's the most popular. Uh, and if we look at a mean stack. So a mean stack is Mongo, Express, uh, Angular, and Node.js. Um, Express fits in there really well because it's expressive and it's easy for anyone to pick up. And here in a moment we'll do an Express example. Uh, PM2 is one of the more popular um, just service daemons out there. So if, with PM2 if you tell it, here's my Node.js executable um, Run this script on my behalf, please. And it will take care of that. And if, in the case of your service crashing or something bad happening, it will automatically restart those. Uh, Bower, Grunt, and Gulp. Um, you probably have used this, uh, one of these tools for other projects. 
they work really well outside of the Node.js um, community. Uh, on projects where I'm doing a ton of .NET development, we still use Bower for all of our client-side um, uh, services. Uh, we then use Gulp to go through and take care of all of our asset um, generation. So um, cleaning up CSS and JavaScript files and minifying and compressing them, um, all that's done with Gulp. And these are just, these work because they're built on top of Node.js and they're implemented, um, sent out via NPM. So you might be using Node.js and not really realizing that you're using Node.js. So hosting, if you've uh, built out a small Node.js service, you need a place to put it. Uh, and there's a variety of places that you can do this. Um, first, uh, one of my favorites is a service called Modulus. And Modulus is focused primarily on Node.js um, deployment. So if all you have is um, a directory with some Node.js files in it, if you push those to Modulus, Modulus will automatically realize you're pushing Node.js um, and take care of the proper setup and configuration, and then just run your application on your behalf. Uh, if you're on the Azure stack, uh, you can push to Windows Azure Web Apps. Uh, again, similar to Modulus, if you have a group of files and you just push them up, um, Windows Azure will automatically detect that um, you're pushing a Node.js stack and set up the proper configurations. Uh, the same thing exists on Amazon Web Services with Elastic Beanstalk. Um, and this is it if you want a um, more automated deployment um, uh, setup. The worst case scenario is that you can just self-host. Um, so I primarily recommend if you're self-hosting any Node.js service, uh, you should be running on Linux um, because all the tools for maintaining a, uh, a Node.js service, uh, PM2, Forever, and Upstart, those, those work really well on Linux. Uh, their support on Windows is, exists, but it's not as well supported as you would probably want it to be. Um, if you're deploying the Windows, there's also a package out there called IIS Node, which allows you to run Node.js services under IIS uh, in the same way you would ASP.NET or such. Uh, and in fact, if you're pushing Node.js to Azure Web Apps, you're technically running under IIS Node. Uh, it just takes care of all that configuration for you. Uh, and all these things are open source. You can go to GitHub and look at, see how they work. Uh, you can um, put in issues if you run into any um, anything, uh, and they're they got great communities behind them. All right, so I I'm going to go play around for a couple minutes, um, and I'm just going to show you a little bit of the Node.js stack, um, and I'll show you how we pull in a package and how we configure it. Um, nothing too complicated. Uh, don't forget to Put your questions into the Q&A panel, and here in about 10 minutes, we'll jump in and start answering some questions. All right. All right, so let me uh, come in here. So on the screen, uh, I have the uh, example app from the Node.js website. So if I go to... I go to Node.js.org. Um, they used to have it on the front page, but they moved it to the About screen. They have a real simple web application um, uh, code, and I've already copied and pasted that in. Uh, their example is written with ES6, um, so if you're not ready to run with ES6 yet, that's fine. ES5 is still fully supported. Uh, I've already converted a little bit of this code to ES5 just so it's not too radical of a change for, for anyone. And what happens on 
in this uh, particular script uh, is a couple of things. Uh, the first line, we have a require. And a require is a way that Node.js um, uh, pulls in dependencies. So all these are their own self-contained modules that allow Node.js, uh, allow you to, to do different things. Uh, this is a core module, um, HTTP. Uh, there's also HTTPS if you uh, need to talk uh, SSL. There's a whole list of them uh, in the docs on Node.js.org. So let's see. And they've changed the docs, so of course it's not easy for me to find. There we go. Uh, this is some of the older um, docs, but it still applies. Uh, HTTP, HTTPS. If you need to talk to the OS, there's OS module. Uh, there's timers. Uh, there's a variety of, but there's a variety of built-in core modules that uh, allow you to do common things in the OS. Uh, the same way that you would in any other programming language, uh, Java, C Sharp, C++, etc. But we need HTTP because we want to talk to, uh, we want to talk web server. Um, I want to declare a couple other variables here. Host name, just I'm going to run on a local host on port 1337. And with the HTTP module, I'm going to create a new server. And the server is going to take a callback. Uh, and that callback will have uh, two parameters, the request object and the response object. So anytime a request comes into our server, it doesn't matter what that request is, it's going to have to go through uh, this callback. And when we get a request, we'll write a 200 status code. and tell the browser we're sending back plain text, and it should just write hello world. And that's all the web server is going to do. The next line here uh, is just chaining off of the server that we um, we build. We're going to tell it to start listening on our particular port and whatever host name that we designated. Uh, and when the server is completely ready to start listening, um, it's going to execute uh, another callback. Now if I go to a command prompt, sorry, let me bump up fonts a little. I thought I had taken care of that. There we go. Uh, so if I come in here and I say node uh, index, that will tell Node.js to grab this file and start executing it. Uh, so it's running, server running at localhost 1337. So I'll do localhost 1337. It spits out hello world. And remember what I said, it will respond with hello world for any request that we're sending. So if I come in here and say foo bar hello world, it's going to return hello world. Um, doesn't matter what my request is for. So how would I figure out what the what the particular path is? Well, I would have to dive into this requ this request object. So I'd probably have to build my own module that determines, all right, is it a git request or a post request or a put or whatnot? Uh, what's the path of the request? And then send that code to, to different places. That's how we could do it. You're not actually ever going to write that code. You're going to use a, a package instead. So I'm going to show you how to pull an express. So let's go back to the command prompt. And I'm going to use the Node Package Manager uh, to install Express. And it just takes a second. Uh, and we see kind of what NPM has done here. It's created a new folder called Node Modules. And inside of Node Modules, zoom in a little. App zoom doesn't work in go to webinar. All right, uh, so it creates a folder for Express, and any packages that I install hereafter, they'll all get put under this Node Modules folder. And what's nice about all these modules is that they maintain their own list of dependencies. 
uh, and so on and so on. So now that I have Express, I can go clean up this code a little bit. I'm going to go up to the top and I'm going to pull in Express. And then down here at the bottom, I'm going to create a new app, which is going to be a new instance of Express. And then I'm going to tell the app that when it gets a git request to the default route slash, I want it to execute a callback. And this callback, I'm going to send the response, hello world. And then finally, I'll tell it to listen on my port. And I'm not going to worry about the host name. All right, so let's uh, oh, and also put a callback in here. And we'll say listening on port one three three seven. All right, so let's uh, let's try this again. All right, I'm listening on port one three three seven. Let's go to Hello world. All right, so I get hello world. If we go into, oops, if we go into the request headers, we'll see it actually sends back as HTML. Uh, that's because Express is taking care of the content negotiation for me. So if I tell it, okay, um, I want this to be strong. And let me restart. So now if I refresh again, it comes back as strong, um, a bolded text. So I don't have to worry about uh, the content I'm sending back. Now let's, uh, let's add another git in here. So if I say git uh, foo, well git foo, uh, I don't actually want to send back a a string. I want to send back an object. I'm going to send an object where I say hello world let me restart my server alright so I still have hello world but now if I go to slash foo look I got JSON back. I can prove it. I'm Go into my network tab, uh, and I'm getting back applica application slash JSON. So Express is taking care of a lot of the heavy lifting for us. It's taking care of the translation of a particular request, which a request, as far as we're concerned, is just the the verb. I'm getting get, post, put, delete, etc., uh, and then the route. So because I only have route set up for slash and for foo, that means if I came in here and try to go to slash bar, I get a 404, which is what I would want to get. Uh, I would have to come in and separately set up uh, the request. Now, what happens if I want to do a post? Well, uh, Express uses what's called Sinatra syntax. Um, so if you've worked in the, the Rails community, if you've worked with Sinatra, um, this should be second nature. Uh, and it's all based off the verb. So if I'm saying get here and get there, what if I said post? And I say post to foo and send a request and response. Well, this would take care of post to foo. Uh, same thing with delete and same thing with put. Um, if you're getting fancy, you could say patch um, or heck, even options. They're they're all supported um, because they're HTTP verbs. All right. So the last little thing I'll show you is uh, how you prep something like this for deployment. Um, and 
the step uh, for deployment is you have to create a additional file called a package.json file. And that's done uh, it's done like this. At the command prompt, here let me clean up my view. You'll run npm uh, with a command called init. And what this does is it asks you a couple questions about your your project. Uh, what's it's called? What version is it? Do you want to have a description? What's the main file or entry point? Um, it's going to try to detect this by default. So if you call your app index.js uh, or app.js, it's going to try to figure that out. If you have automated testing, you can type in what the test command is. And uh, you could actually tell NPM to run your test on your behalf. Uh, if this is already hooked up to a Git repository. Um, it will pre-populate here with the, the path to your Git repository. Uh, SEO type keywords if you want to tag them out. Uh, your name if you want to put it in. And also if you have a license, you can put that in as well. And this is going to go through and write a package.json file. Uh, the package.json file is information for you or anyone that pulls this project in the future. Uh, one of the nice thing it does is it looks at all your dependencies and pulls out those dependencies for you. So because we have a dependency on Express, it's going to write into the file. We rely on Express 4.13.3. Um, so if I go through and I upgrade that package later um, and anyone pulls down the new version, uh, they could just simply run npm install and it'll go grab the latest version of any package that we need. Uh, so last it asks, is this okay? I'll say yes. This spits out a package.json file. What do you want to look at? Nothing, nothing too spectacular about it. Uh, and then I would push, push this up into source control. So in source control, we would have no. We wouldn't push up node modules. That should be a part of your ignore. Um, you should just push up your JavaScript and your package JSON. Uh, because let's say someone across the hall pulls this repository, they won't have node modules. So how do they get it back? Um, they just have to run npm install. That will look at the package JSON file and all the dependencies and go pull them back down again. So we can see node modules is back. Uh, in the future, when you add new packages, now let's say I want to type, um, let's see, I want to grab lodash. Uh, if you run this command by itself, it's not going to automatically update that package.json file for you. You have to use a command argument called dash dash save. And what this will do, so we'll grab lodash. And it will automatically update the package.json file for you. Um, this is just common. I've run into this many times where, uh, so if I just said underscore, oops, if I type it right, um, it will install underscore, and that's great, except it doesn't update my dependencies. Uh, at this point, I would have to go run npm and edit again, uh, or I'd have to manually update this file. So uh, just something to keep uh, keep track of. And every time you do a pull from source control, uh, just run npm install. And if there's nothing to install, that's fine. It'll just, uh, just do nothing. Uh, but if there's an updated package um, or whatnot, it will automatically install the latest that it needs. So all righty. Let me jump back in here. All right, so Q&A time. Um, I've seen a whole bunch of questions pop into the, the queue. I'm going to go through a couple of them. All right, let's see. All right, Marcus says, hello. Hello, Marcus. Um, uh, what do you enjoy about Node.js that the .NET environment doesn't offer? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, the, 
I've worked I've worked a lot in in .NET. I've worked a lot in Node.js. I've worked a lot in a bunch of different environments. Uh, the thing I've always liked about Node.js is I could I can very quickly write code in Node.js, and because of its dynamic nature, um, there's a lot of ceremony I don't have to rely um, I that I don't have to worry about writing. Uh, a great example is just database access. So if um, if I'm in a .NET project or or, or a static environment, uh, if I want to read from a database, I probably have to go build build out all the class definitions of how that data should be structured. I have to write the logic that goes and does the query and then pulls back a reader and formats that data to fit into the classes I've designed. If I ever change that data, all right, now I have to go through and write maybe a V1 and, or a V2 version of that class, and it's a it's a it's a lot of headache. Um, in Node.js, because it's all dynamic, I just go and make my request to the database, and stuff comes back, um, and I don't have to worry about all the uh, cr creating objects at at runtime. Um, because it's all dynamic, I just get an object back with all my data inside of it. Now, if I'm the 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 con of that is it's it's loosely typed, and if I mistype a, a variable name, um, I could have a logic error that I don't realize um, much later on. Uh, but it's really nice to just be able to knock out a whole bunch of Node.js code, and it does a lot more in the fraction of the time it takes me to do it in, in .NET. Um, but I really like the safety of a static environment um, for a lot of stuff I'm doing. All right. Uh, will slides be available after the webinar? Uh, they're supposed to be, um, and this recording is supposed to be available as well. All right. Uh, even with multiple cores on a machine, it does everything using one thread. That's that's correct. Um, unless you're you wire up uh, Node.js to use Cluster, which is the package designed to um, implement multiple processes, uh, you're only going to use one thread. Um, so you're only going to use one core. Uh, so you have to have to be mindful of that. Um, one of our deployment techniques for um, for Azure was well, I can get away with using the cheapest machine on Azure, which is one core and a couple gigs of RAM. Uh, and if I need to add more, it's in my better interest just to allocate new machines that are all one core and let a load balancer deal with um, sending messages uh, between these different machines. Uh, that was less headache than it was to take our node service uh, and build it to be take better advantage of multiple cores. Um, it all costs the same, but it's less headache for, for us. Uh, is AngularJS an alternative to Node.js? Uh, no, we're talking apples and oranges. Um, Node.js is the server implementation of JavaScript, um, uh, a server JavaScript engine, server-based JavaScript engine. AngularJS is just is client side um, client side stuff. So you're not using Angular JS on the server at all. Um, but so, but you could wire up Angular JS on the client to talk to uh, to services written in Node JS. Um, all right. Uh, do you recommend Heroku as a hosting as well? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Nothing wrong with Heroku. Um, just wasn't on my page. Um, I don't do too much work on Heroku just because, uh, but I have lots of friends that do, so nothing wrong with them at all. Um, all right, Jonathan said, uh, I see a lot of folks using dash G or dash dash save when using NPM. Um, thoughts on using these? Uh, yeah, um, a couple packages that you might install, uh, you'll use the dash G. Um, uh, so if I said npm install dash g express, what that does is it installs express globally, um, meaning 
I don't have to manage it from project to project. It's installed at a machine level, and any application on the machine that needs to use Express will have access to it. Um, I don't. Now, there's a couple packages where you need to do that, uh, but they're mostly for uh, development, like Node Inspector, um, a couple others I can't think of off the top of my head. Um, but for development projects, I don't normally use Dash G. Uh, I will. Uh, I much rather have Express um, as a local dependency than a global dependency, just because if I push this up into source control, I want I might have two or three projects that all use Express, but use different versions of Express, um, just depending on how quickly we can upgrade. So having it installed globally might hurt me more than it would help me. Um, uh, but Dash G is is great. Uh, and I already showed you all uh, save, and that's useful if you want to commit into your package JSON file automatically. Uh, what editor was I using? Um, I was using the Atom editor uh, by GitHub. Um, it's free, open source, uh, download. Um, I was having a couple issues with some plugins. Um, but it works really well. Um, I love it. You can also use just regular Notepad, Notepad++, Sublime, um, or uh, Visual Studio Code. They all work really well with Node.js out of the box. All right. Do you need to explicitly update package.js, JSON with new resources? Uh, yes. And so anytime you want to do an upgrade, um, you you have to come in and make some changes here. So uh, at the command prompt, if I say npm uh, upgrade, say right now there's nothing to do. Um, and it all depends on what this value is. Uh, this is a semantic versioning. So this will only update if um, I really suck at remembering the details. So if um, so major, minor, build, if build increments, um, so this goes to 0.4, that's not going to be a API break and change. So NPM update will allow that. Um, I could come in here and make adjustments like I want, uh, all right, so let's say I just want any four release. I could say something like this. Um, normally, I don't mess with this too, too much uh, because once you start doing upgrades, uh, especially in a team environment, um, you can run into issues. Things like Express aren't a huge deal. They won't break the API unless they uh, increment the major version. Um, there's a package out there called... Uh, now I gotta look. So npm. I don't remember what it's called now. Up, uh, check updates. Um, that will. This package will look at all your uh, dependencies and package.json, and it'll tell you this is the version that you um, you're using. This is the version you could go up to. Um, it will perform those updates on your behalf if you want them to. Um, but this is a good uh, good tool to have installed. And this is an example of something you would install globally, so you could use it in any project. All right. Um, can it handle HTTP context in sessions? Um, oh, you must be a .NET guy. Um, so in uh, Express, or really the HTTP module, um, you have a request, not really a context, but I guess you could call it the request context, and you have the response context. Um, the request object has um, all the information this, all the information that we have for uh, the incoming request. Um, so any uh, parameters, any cookies, anything like that. Um, 
it doesn't do sessions by by default. Um, in Express, if you want to do sessions, you can install um, middleware, so other other packages that bolt on um, on top of Node.js, and it will implement things like sessions for you. Uh, and if any of you have been looking at any of the new ASP.NET stuff, um, the ASP.NET uh, v5, uh, one thing that you might take away from that is they have borrowed very heavily from the how a Express app is developed, um, how uh, how middleware is injected. So if you have messed with ASP.NET v5 at all, uh, it should be second nature to jump into Node.js because uh, Node.js with Express um, was the original concept that they stole from. All right. Why is it recommended to avoid checking in Node modules folder? Um, uh, because you don't check in your you don't check in dependencies. Um, so if we were looking at any other platform out there, uh, I would tell you. You don't check in your binaries. You don't check in your your dependencies. Um, stuff that you can just simply uh, uh, repopulate um, later. Uh, another thing you might have to look out for is if I'm developing on Windows and you're developing on Mac, um, the executables in your Node modules folder won't work on my machine, uh, and vice versa. So some things will need to be compiled at a native level. So uh, that's why you don't deploy, you don't check in node modules. Uh, because if I pull it down and I'm on Windows and you were on Mac, uh, I need to make sure that the dependencies compile for my environment. Uh, is there a concept of child threads in Node.js? Uh, yep, that's what the cluster um, package is for. Um, uh, it's not a... It's not a recommended um, uh, train of thought. If you're looking at, at doing multi-threading in Node.js, your the the common response is going to be you're you're not looking at the problem the right way. Um, you're you're probably in a case where you might need just completely different applications, uh, or or you're trying to make a single Node.js application do too much. Um, so if you wanted to have one service that was a web server and then another service that was um, uh, looking at an event stack or um, some sort of queue, uh, those would be completely different services. You wouldn't run those. You wouldn't run those as separate threads um, because they would they should be completely separate services. Uh, a couple people asking, does Node.js support SQL Server? Yes. Uh, yep. There. Uh, there's a couple of packages out there. One's fully supported by Microsoft. Um, they they work pretty well. Um, um, let's see. Have you faced any major challenges converting enterprise applications to Node.js? Um, not really major challenges. Uh, if you, it's just a, a matter of of changing your your thinking. Um, when you work in something like uh, Java, C plus plus, or C sharp, um, you're generally thinking very statically. So something that's fairly simple, like talking to a database, uh, you have to put a lot of thought into because you have to build all these devices around managing that connection and then manipulating the data that you get back. Um, in Node.js, you just don't worry about any of that stuff um, because it's all dynamic. Uh, you get data back and the object you get is a fully, is maybe just an array of results and all those results are uh, your field names and you just use the data as though um, that's how it was meant to be used. You don't have to map everything to an object uh, for it to work properly. Um, so that was our, our biggest issue. Um, when we converted WinSitter from a .NET app uh, to Node.js, we gave ourselves, we had been working on it for a year, 
and we gave ourselves three weeks um, to do an in in conversion. Um, and we were about 95% done by the time um, um, by the time we had kicked off. And we had 95% of our full functionality. So things like all of our web services um, were fully implemented. We had different processes for um, for doing background tests and whatnot. We really took advantage of the how easy it was to start up a script and manage the life cycle of a script um, to to do a lot of things. Whereas in when we were in .NET, uh, we had our main web server that handled most of the requests, um, but then we had to set up uh, uh, different child processes for for doing just regular background tasks and cleanup. Um, it was a little bit. It was more straightforward with our Node.js application. Uh, is there a Node.js driver to consume SOAP services um, such as WCF? Yes. Uh, I actually had a project uh, last year. We did a um, we did a a codeathon um, where we had to talk to a public API, uh, and they were all SOAP based. Um, so we found a package that would consume SOAP services uh, by default. Um, so remember what I said about the community. If there's, if you are thinking, has someone solved this problem? The odds are is yes, they probably have. Uh, best ID to work with Node.js? Uh, really any text editor um, is really good. Um, Sublime, Atom, co uh, VS Code. Um, uh, those of you out there who use Full Visual Studio, um, Visual it has a uh, Node.js support as well. Works really well. Um, but really, all you need is a text editor. Uh, I don't typically trust editors that have IntelliSense and um, completion built into them because with JavaScript they can be misleading. Uh, it helps um, a little bit, but sometimes it can be misleading. Uh, can Node.js talk to the Sybase or SQL Server? Uh, so yes, SQL Server, yes to Sybase. Uh, really, if you can talk to it in any other language, you can talk to it in, um, in Node.js. Uh, in terms of performance compared to the Java Spring framework, um, I do not have enough experience with, uh, with um, the Spring framework to, to give you a good answer there. Um, I'm sure there are plenty of people on the internet who have done those sort of comparisons. Um, or uh, go look at Tech Empowered um, that I talked about earlier. They um, they probably have Spring somewhere in their stack. Um, so I would say in terms of uh, just the more higher ranking stacks on Tech Empowered, a lot of them are they're either C++ or Java based. Um, even so if, if you go farther and farther down, that's where you start to see the um, the Node.js's, the C-sharps, the um, uh, like Pythons and stuff like that. But most of the highest ranking ones are C++ or Java. We have legacy Perl code that runs on Apache using mod Perl. Where would this fit in? Uh, I don't know if I have enough um, information there. Uh, if your Perl code is running, acting as a web server, so exposing web services or serving up HTML, um, you would just simply, uh, you could take those routes um, and you could just use something like Express to uh, expose those routes, but, but just um, basically doing the same thing, but it's all Node.js. Uh, what's nice about Express is if you don't, uh, if you are coming from an existing framework, you can basically hard code the the routes that you had previously. So it's much easier for you to go from an old, um, an older platform to a new platform just by saying, okay, well the old system used this route, and we want to support that route. Um, and you just say app.get, the name of the route, and then the, the handler.
Uh, best examples of complex node apps um, to review for best practices. Um, there's, uh, I hate talking about best practices. Uh, there's a couple of good books out there that I don't have the titles off the top of my head because they might not even be relevant anymore. Uh, one of the problems that we have is the the versioning of Node over the past six months has jumped dramatically. Um, it has gone from 0.12 to now v5. So the um, things that were considered best practices six months ago might not be considered best practices now, or the best practices have adapted a little. Um, so uh, yeah, I would say anything that's dated more than six months ago probably isn't too relevant. Uh, I know it's it's horrible. Um, it also brings up another good point: is that you're when we say jumping off the deep end, it's you're you're committing. Uh, you you don't treat a Node.js development cycle like you would a um, a, a life cycle in C sharp or C plus plus or whatnot. You're you're not going to just be on a version for ten years. Um, you have to go into these expecting uh, to update. And keep going forward every couple of weeks, if not every, um, or every couple of months, if not every couple of weeks. Uh, a regular part of our uh, strategy was doing updates on our packages. So we would have a sprint that was just update packages, run through all of our regression tests, and make sure that we didn't break anything. Um, and the the benefit of that is. Performance improved a little bit, um, but we were always on a somewhat latest version. Uh, doo -doo. Uh, it seems like there's a latest and greatest JavaScript something every week these days. Uh, how do you keep on top um, of the evolving stack? Um, the The first tip is you don't stress too much about it. Um, the community is going to keep pushing forward, um, but if you, it doesn't involve you and not doesn't involve anything you're actively working on, you can probably ignore 95% of what's going on out there. Um, I can probably safely say that most of the packages that are used on a regular basis uh, by 90% of apps out there uh, they're they're pretty they're pretty sturdy. They're not radically changing. There's nothing coming in and superseding them um, every day. Uh, t things like Twitter, um, just observe. Um, you don't have to commit to anything. Just observe and see what people are talking about. Um, that's kind of my big tip. Is I just see what people are doing out there. Uh, I read every now and then just uh, different um, newsletters based on Node.js. And things are getting pretty stable nowadays. So I don't think it's as radical as it was a year or two ago. Uh, is there a connection pooling in Node.js? Uh, there is uh, there is a backlog. Um, and it's actually one of the, the problems with it being single thread is that there is a physical limit of how much um, a single Node.js process can can handle um, the the benchmark for 54,000 requests per second. Um, a that request probably wasn't doing too much, um, and it was probably just demonstrating uh, coming in how quickly can it uh, create the HTTP object and how quickly can it process a result. Um, when you are getting up into the higher numbers, you're probably using other tricks. Uh, I'd have to actually go into their the code for their benchmarks to see uh, to see what they were doing to get the numbers they were getting. Um, even things like what server you're running on can make a huge difference. Uh, if I'm running uh, Node.js on just a standard Linux machine with nothing in front of it, um, I don't get it's Node.js that's handling everything. Um, which m gives me no benefit. 
Uh, if I was running on Windows in front of an IS node, then IS will take care of a lot of connection pulling and just general backlog uh, on my behalf. Um, so what we've found in the past is if I take the same Node.js service and put it on Windows and put it on Linux and just throw as many requests as I can per second at it, um, the Linux machine will hit a hard limit and just start um, start dropping connections. Uh, the ones running in front of IS node will at least hold the, the connections open and process them as quickly as they can. Um, I'd rather have a slow response than a, a um, crashed response. Uh, but uh, like most answers, it depends. Uh, let's see, can Node.js mix with ASP.NET on the server side? Um, can we incrementally migrate ASP.NET to Node.js? Um, uh, again, we're, it depends on how complicated your ASP.NET app is. Um, you could start with running the two in, well, you can't even really run the two in, in parallel on the same machine because um, they'll both want to to talk on the same port, and it, that won't work. Uh, what you would probably do, um, yeah, in that scenario, you can't really do that. Uh, you would have to set up one service as the ASP.NET one up as legacy and then start developing the Node.js one. Um, as the the new production, and as and then gradually move yourself from one service to another, um, but there's no mechanism, as far as I know, to run them uh, in parallel at the same time. Uh, let's see. And last question, and then we'll have to wrap up. Uh, for reusability purposes, can we create Node.js modules and install them? Um, using npm install or will we have to publish to the npm uh, you can definitely create your own packages um, we've done that quite a bit uh, you don't have uh, with those type of packages you don't install them using npm um, so npm is anything that's up on the npm website you well all right there's a couple different ways I can answer this you can push them up to NPM as a private um, package manager, which means only people that you give access to can download certain packages. Um, most packages pushed to NPM are public, meaning anyone can get them. Uh, what we've done in the past is we've just created separate, um, separate module. Um, well, actually, no, I take that back. We've, we've set up private GitHub repos uh, for packages that we've been creating and you can do npm installs from git repos uh, or from uh, file system locations so you still use npm you're just not hitting the npm website um, so the answer is yes <laughs> uh, there's just there's a process involved to, to take care of all that stuff so Alrighty, well, I'm about 15 minutes over time, um, which is not a problem. You all had amazing questions, and thank you so much for for hanging out with me. Uh, again, if you're interested in learning a lot more about using Node.js and um, um, Mongo, Express, Angular, and Node, uh, I definitely recommend checking out our three-day course. Uh, contact Miss Kimberly Pruitt at kpruitt at wintelect.com and she will give you a 10% off uh, discount for the course and I would love to hang out with you for three days it's very hands-on so you'll write a whole bunch of code um, and it'll be very uh, very uh, directed towards building these uh, sort of applications so if you make it I'd love to hang out with you for three days uh, with that said thank you all so much for attending um, this is recorded, so you should get a notification of the recording um, sooner than later. Uh, but thank you all so much.